The previous example hopefully motivates you to see the relationship between vector fields and systems of differential equations. And in fact, this uh, specific example is actually part of a more general phenomenon. So rather than giving precise definitions, let me just sort of give you an intuitive idea for what differential equations is all about. So imagine that you have um, an nth order differential equation. Um, let's say it's an ordinary differential equation. Um, and it's going to be of the form of a single variable. That's where the O is coming in. Uh, and it's going to be of the form that you have some function of a single variable. And you take its nth derivative, and its nth derivative should be expressed in terms of its lower derivatives. So in general, you have an equation um, of the form, let's say, uh, is equal to a n minus 1, fn minus 1 plus, and these are all, um, let's say for now, constant coefficients, all the way up until a, um, a1, take the first derivative, plus a0. And then just, that's the function itself again, equals 0. And these coefficients could be anything. They could even be 0. Um, and uh, you, you, might even, you might even allow them to be functions themselves of the variable input. And the relationship between such an ordinary differential equation, and some, of course, initial conditions, uh, and the relationship of that to vectors and vector fields is the following. So if we define sort of a, a new coordinate, we can define x1. This is going to be our variable. And we'll define x1 to be the, um, the actual function f itself. And then we can set x2 to be the first derivative of f, and so on up until we define xn, and xn is the, I guess, n minus first derivative, right? And so we define these variables. And if we look at this, what we can do is we can convert our nth order differential equation into a set of differential equations of the following form. So using this, we define this, then what we see is that the derivative of x1 with respect to its input variable, let's say the variable is t, but I won't write it just so that it's cleaner, is equal to um, x2, right? If we write this, then this equals x2. And then if we go down this list in the zigzag, we see that x2 prime equals x3, and so on, up until xn prime, which is equal to fn. Um, let's write it this way. A naught f, and f was x1, plus a1 x2. We don't see it. Oh, here it is, right? a1 x2 plus dot 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 plus a n minus 1 x n minus, sorry, x n. It's just x n. So how is this new set of equations, now instead of having one differential equation, one nth order differential equation, we have n first order differential equations. How is this related to vector fields? We can define a vector field v from Rn to Rn by V of x1 through xn. And now because the codomain is Rn, this has n components. So it makes sense to look at this uh, for each of its components. So let's look at Vj. Then Vj, if we look down this list, vj is going to be x j plus 1 if j is strictly less than n. But as soon as j equals n, we get this entire list. And this equals a0 x1 plus a1 x2 all the way up to an minus 1 xn for j equals n.
So this defines a vector field. We know what it is for every single j, and if we can draw this out, then we can actually plot a vector field. And then we can look at the integral curves of this vector field, find solutions and all that, and when we plug this back all the way in, working our way backwards, we will find a solution for this ordinary differential equation. So this gives us a way of realizing that nth order differential equations are just special cases of first order differential equations in terms of vector fields. And so more generally, what we have is we have n coupled differential equations described by some vector field. And such systems are called dynamical systems. What are some kind of examples of such dynamical systems? Well, in physics, um, one convenient way of re-expressing Newton's laws and a lot of the laws that govern uh, gravity, electrodynamics, and other types of intermolecular forces that, for which we do not include quantum effects, these can almost always be described by what's known as a Hamiltonian. And a Hamiltonian is essentially a function denoted by H on, let's say, an even number of coordinates, so 2m. And it's just a function of these two coordinates. We can define, so this function is called a Hamiltonian, though y is, for now, um, not important. There's a Hamiltonian, and from this Hamiltonian, we can obtain a vector field on R2M. So define the associated Hamiltonian vector field VH, which is also on R2M. So if we denote the first coordinates, so let's write this as Rm cross Rm, and if we denote the first pair of coordinates by, let's say, Q1 through Qm, and then the second pair of coordinates as P1 through Pm, and the interpretation of these coordinates is that Q stands for the position and the P's stand for the momentum, and we're going to think of this as the positions and momentums of a particle or collection of particles in some space. Maybe oftentimes this is not only even dimensional, but it's, it's a multiple of six, corresponding to for every particle in three dimensional space, it has a position in three dimensions, and it also has a momentum, which is related to its velocity, also in three dimensions. So we define a vector field by so the first entry of this vector field is taking the derivative of h with respect to the p variables. So vh is given by the derivative of h with respect to the first p variable, p1, the derivative with respect to the second p variable, p2, and so on, up until the last one. And then, as soon as you start going into the other m coordinates that are left over, you instead tack on a minus sign. So it's the partial derivative of the position now of h with a minus sign attached to it. So in particular, we assume that this function, its partial derivatives are defined. So I should at least mention that this is a differentiable function. And with this vector field, we can now write down a similar system of differential equations. And the solutions of these differential equations describe the motion of a particle or a collection of particles that are subject to a force that's typically dictated by this Hamiltonian, this function, h. So for example, as a sub-example of this one, 
uh, we can look at the equation that describes, let's say, a, um, a pendulum that swings back and forth. Let's say it's hung up on some ceiling like this, and there's a ball of some mass m attached, and the string is of some length l, and there's gravity pointing down, so gravity we assume is acting on this pendulum. Then we can write down a Hamiltonian associated to the system, and for simplicity, the, and by the way, the um, so if we call our variable, instead of calling our variable the position, we instead use the angle that's subtended by this pendulum. The uh, one Hamiltonian associated to this as a function of theta and p is given by p squared over 2 plus 1 minus cosine of theta. And the one is essentially irrelevant. And what I've done was I've set all of my constants, g, l, m, all of them equal to 1, just so that I don't have to deal with all those numbers. And this, physically speaking, describes the energy of the pendulum when it's at an angle theta and it has momentum p. And if we try to write down the associated vector field, so we have two possible coordinates, so we have vh, the first coordinate, which is in the theta coordinate. So this equals, take the derivative of this with respect to p, that just gives us p itself. And then we can take in the second coordinate the derivative of this Hamiltonian with respect to theta. And that gives us sine of theta. So this is our vector field and we have two variables. So our associated system of differential equations is theta prime equals p and p prime equals sine theta. Now if theta were small, so if theta were very very tiny, this could be approximated to be theta itself. And I see here I forgot a minus sign, right? minus cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine, but we have an additional minus sign here. This should have a minus sign. So this has a minus sign, this has a minus sign. So now, this looks exactly like the differential equation we were looking at earlier, where we had a vector field that looked like concentric circles moving around. And you can check that if you plot the vector field associated to this function and the vector field associated to that previous uh, function that we had, you'll see that near zero, which is near theta equals zero and p equals zero, the two vector fields look almost the same. But they start to deviate once the angle gets larger. And we can write down a solution to this, but it's not so trivial. And instead, I urge you to plot these two vector fields and sort of get a feeling for what the trajectory lines look like. There are still periodic trajectories. Obviously, you can imagine that if you lift this by some amount and you let it go, it'll move back and forth. And this particular Hamiltonian does not assume that, um, that, there's, a, that there's any friction or air resistance at all, and that this pendulum will just proceed like this for an infinite amount of time. And you can also imagine that there are other solutions when you look at those trajectories. And you might think, well, what happens if I increase theta, the initial condition, or if I increase it more and more and more, or if I kick it really hard, you might think, well, eventually, it might start to roll over and start going, go back and forth. Or you might think, well, what happens if it's standing upright? And if you just move it slightly to the left or to the right, what's gonna happen? If it's standing upright and its initial position and its initial momentum is zero, then you can imagine it's going to be like that forever. And you'll see that the solutions to, these, to this differential equation gives you that sort of motion. So I think this is interesting, the fact that you can start with a differential equation, obtain a vector field from it, 
And then in this sense, vector fields are sort of more general dynamical systems than ordinary differential equations. And physically speaking, these kind of vector fields arise very um, often from a Hamiltonian function.